Chapter 133, The Chase, First Day. That night in the midwatch, when the old man, as his wont at intervals, stepped forth from the scuttle in which he leaned and went to his pivot hole, he suddenly thrust out his face fiercely, snuffing up the sea air as a sagacious ship's dog will, in drawing nigh to some barbarous isle. He declared that a whale must be near. Soon that peculiar odor, sometimes to a great distance giving forth by a living sperm whale, was palpable to all the watch. Nor was any mariner surprised when after inspecting the compass, and then the dog vane, and then ascertaining the precise bearing of the odor as nearly as possible, Ahab rapidly ordered the ship's course to be slightly altered and the sail to be shortened. The acute policy dictating these movements was sufficiently vindicated at daybreak by the sight of a long sleek on the sea directly and lengthwise ahead, smooth as oil and resembling in the pleated watery wrinkles bordering it the polished metallic-like marks of some swift tide rip at the mouth of a deep, rapid stream. Man the mastheads! Call all hands! Thundering with the butts of three clubbed hand spikes on the forecastle deck, Dagoo roused the sleepers with such judgment claps that they seemed to exa exhale from the scuttle. So instantaneously did they appear with their clothes in their hands. What do you see? cried Ahab, flattening his face to the sky. Nothing, nothing, sir, was the sound hailing down in reply. To gallant sails, stun sails, allow and aloft, and on both sides. All sail being set, he now cast loose the lifeline, reserved for swaying him to the main royal mast head, in a few moments they were hoisted him thither, when, while but two-thirds the way aloft, and while peering ahead through the horizontal vacancy between the main top sail and the top gallant sail, he raised a, a gull-like cry in the air. There she blows! There she blows! A hump like a snow hill! It is Moby Dick. Fired by the cry, which seemed simultaneously taken up by the three lookouts, the men on the, duck rushed, men on the deck rushed to the rigging to behold the famous whale they had so long been pursuing. Ahab had now gained his final perch, some feet above the other lookouts. Tashtego, standing just beneath him on the cap of the top gallant mast, so that the Indian's head was almost on a level with Ahab's heel. From this height, the whale was now seen some mile or so ahead at every roll of the sea, revealing his high, sparkling hump, and regularly jetting his silent spout into the air. To the credulous mariners, it seemed the same silent spout they had so long ago beheld in the moonlit Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And did none of, the, none of ye see it before? cried Ahab, hailing the perched men all around him. I saw him almost the same instant, sir. That Captain Ahab did, and I cried out, said Tashtego. Now the same instant, not the same. No, the doubloon is mine. Fate reserved the doubloon for me. I only. None of ye could have raised the white whale first. There she blows, there she blows, there she blows. There again, there again. He cried in long-drawn, lingering, methodic tones, attuned to the gradual prolonging of the whale's visible jets. He's going to sound. He sun sails. Down top gallant sails. Stand by three boats. Mr. Starbuck, remember, stay on board and keep the ship. Helm there. Luff, luff a point. So, steady, man, steady. There go flukes. No, no, only black water. All ready the boats there. Stand by. Stand by. Lower me. Mr. Starbuck, lower. Lower. Quick, quicker. And he slid through the air to the deck. He is heading straight to the leeward, sir, cried Stubb. Right away from us. Cannot have seen the ship yet. Be dumb, man. Stand by the braces. Hard down the helm. Brace up. Shiver her. Shiver her. So well that boats, boats. Soon all the boats but Starbucks were dropped. All the boat sails set. All the paddles plying. With rippling swiftness, shooting to leeward. And Ahab, heading the onset... A pale, death glimmer lit up Fadala's sun, sunken eyes. A hideous motion gnawed his mouth. Like noiseless, nautilus shells, 
their light prow spread, sped through the sea, but only slowly they neared the foe. As they neared him, the ocean grew still more smooth, seemed drawing a carpet over its wave, seemed a noon meadow, so serenely it spread. At length, the breathless hunter came so nigh, his seemingly unsuspecting prey at his entire dazzling hump was distinctly visible, sliding along the sea as if an isolated thing and continually set in a revolving ring of finest fleecy greenish foam. He saw the vast involved wrinkles of the slightly projecting head beyond. Before it far out on the soft Turkish rugged waters went the glistening white shadow from his broad milky forehead, a musical rippling playfully accompanying the shade and behind the blue waters interchangeably flowed over into the moving valley of his steady wake. And on either hand, bright bubbles arose and danced by his side. But these were broken again by the light toes of hundreds of gay fowl softly feathering the sea, alternate with their fitful flight and like to some flagstaff rising from the painted hull of an argosy, the tall but shattered pole of a recent lance projected from the white whale's back. And at intervals, one of the cloud of soft-toed fowls hovering and to and fro skimming like a canopy over the fish, silently perched and rocked on this pole, the long tail feathers streaming like pennons. A gentle joyousness, a, a mighty mildness of repose and swiftness invested the gliding whale. Not the, not the white bull Jupiter swimming away with a vanishing Europa clinging to his graceful horns, his lovely leering eyes sideways intent upon the maid with smooth bewitching fleetness, rippling straight for the nuptial bower in Crete, not Jove, not that great majesty supreme, did surpass the glorified white whale as he so divinely swam. On each soft side, coincident with the parted swell, that but once leaving him then flowed so wide away on each bright side the whale shed off enticings. No wonder there had been some among the hunters who namelessly transported and allured by all this serenity had ventured to assail it, but had fatally found that the quietude but the vestures of tornadoes. Yet calm, enticing calm. O oh, whale, thou glidest on, to all who for the first time eye thee, no matter how many in that same way thou mayest have but juggled and destroyed before. And thus, through the serene tranquillities of the tropical sea, among waves whose hand clappings were suspended by exceeding rapture, Moby Dick moved on, still withholding from sight the full terror of his submerged trunk entirely hiding the wretched hidden, hidden hideousness of his jaw. But soon the forepart of him was slowly rose above from the water. For an instant, his whole marbleized body formed a high arc like Virginia's natural bridge and warningly waving his bannered flukes in the air, the grand God revealed himself, sounded and went out of sight. Hovering, Lee halting, and dipping on the wing, the white sea fowls longingly lingered over the agitated pool that he left. With oars a peak and paddles down, the sheets of their sails adrift, the three boats now stilly floated, awaiting Moby Dick's reappearance. An hour, said Ahab, standing rooted in his boat's stern, and he gazed beyond the, white, the whale's place, toward the dim blue spaces and wide wooing vacancies to leeward. It was only an instant, for again his eyes seemed whirling round in his head as he swept the watery circle. The breeze now freshened, the sea began to swell. The birds, the birds, cried Tashtego. In long Indian file, as when herons take wing, the white birds were now all flying toward Ahab's boat. And when, within a few yards, began fluttering over the water there, wheeling round and round with joyous expectant cries, their vision was keener than man's. Ahab could discover no sign in the sea 
But suddenly, as he peered down and down into the depths, he profoundly saw a white living spot, no bigger than a white weasel, with wonderful celerity uprising and magnifying as it rose till it turned and then there was plainly revealed two long, crooked rows of white, glistening teeth floating up from the undiscoverable bottom. It was Moby Dick's open mouth and scroll jaw, his vast shadowed bulk still half blending with the blue of the sea. The glittering mouth yawned beneath the boat like an open, doored marble tomb, and giving one sidelong sweep with its steering oar, Ahab whirled the craft aside from this tremendous apparition. Then, calling upon Fidella to change places with him, went forward to the bows and, seizing Perth's harpoon, commanded his crew to grasp their oars and stand by to stern. Now, by reason of this timely spinning round, the boat upon its axis, its bow, by anticipation, was made to face the whale's head while yet underwater. But as if perceiving the stratagem, Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, sidlingly transplanted himself, as it were, in an instant, shooting his pleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. Through and through, through every plank and each rib, it thrilled for an instant, the whale obliquely lying on its back in the manner of a biting shark slowly and feelingly taking its bows full within its mouth so that the long, narrow, scrolled lower jaw curled high up into the open air and one of the teeth caught in a rowlock. The bluish pearl white of the inside of the jaw was within six inches of Ahab's head and reached higher than that. In this attitude, the white whale now shook the slight cedar as a mildly cruel cat, her mouse. With unastonished eyes, Fadala gazed and crossed his arms, but the tiger yellow crew were tumbling over each other's heads to gain the uttermost stern. And now, while both elastic gunwales were springing in and out, as the whale dallied with the doomed craft in this devilish way, and from his body being submerged beneath the boat, he could not be darted at from the bows, for the bows were almost inside of him, as it were. And while the other boats involuntarily paused, as before a quick crisis impossible to withstand, then it was that the monomaniac Ahab, furious with this tantalizing vicinity of his foe, which placed him all alive and helpless in the very jaws he hated, frenzied with all this, he seized the long bone with his naked hands and wildly strove to wrench it from its gripe. As now he thus vainly strove, the jaw slipped from him. The frail gunwells bent in, collapsed and snapped as both jaws, like an enormous shears, sliding further aft, bit the craft completely in twain and locked themselves fast again in the sea midway between the two floating wrecks. These floated aside, the broken ends drooping, the, cra the crew at the stern wreck clinging to the gunwells and striving to hold fast to the oars to lash them across. At that preluding moment, at that preluding moment, ere the, bo the boat was yet snapped, Ahab, the first to perceive the whale's intent by the crafty uprising of its head, a movement that loosed his hold, loosed his hold for the time at that moment his hand had made one final effort to push the boat out of the bite, but only slipping further into the whale's mouth and tilting over sideways as it slipped. The boat had shaken off his hold on the jaw, slipped him out of it as he leaned to the push, and so he fell flat-faced upon the sea. Ripplingly withdrawing from his prey, Moby Dick now lay at a little distance, vertically thrusting his oblong white head up and down in the billows, and at the same time slowly revolving his whole spindled body, so that when his vast wrinkled forehead rose some twenty feet or more out of the water, 
the now rising swells with all their confluent waves dazzlingly broke against it, vindictively tossing their shivered spray still higher into the air. So in a gale, the but half baffled channel billows recoil from the base of the Ediston, only triumphantly to overleap its summit with their scud. But soon resuming his horizontal attitude, Moby Dick swam swiftly round and round the wrecked crew, sideways churning the water in his vengeful wake, as if lashing himself up to still another and more deadly assault. The, slight, the sight of the splintered boat seemed to madden him, as the blood of grapes and mulberries cast before Antiochus's elephants in the book of Maccabees, meanwhile Ahab half smothered in the foam of the whale's insolent tail, and too much of a cripple to swim, though he could still keep afloat, even in the heart of such a whirlpool as that, helpless Ahab's head was seen, like a tossed bubble which the least chance shook might burst. From the boat's fragmentary stern, Fidela incuriously and mildly eyed him. The clinging crew at the other end, at the other drifting end, could not succor him. More than enough for, was it for them to look to themselves. For so revolvingly appalling was the white whale's aspect, and so, so planetarily swift the ever contracting circles he made that he seemed horizontally swooping upon them. And though the other boats, unharmed, still hovered hard by, still they not they dared not pull into the eddy to strike, lest that they should be the signal for the instant destruction of the jeopardized castaways. Ahab and all, not in that case could they set themselves hope to escape. With straining eyes, then, they remained on the outer edge of the direful zone, where center had now become the old man's head. Meantime, from the beginning, all this had been described from the ship's mastheads, and squaring her yards, she had borne down upon the scene, and was now so nigh that Ahab in the water hailed her. Sail on the... But that moment a breaking sea dashed on him from Moby Dick, and overwhelmed him for the time. But struggling out of it again, and chancing to rise on a towering crest, he shouted, Sail on the whale! Drive him off! The Pequod's prows were pointed, and breaking up the charmed circle, she effectually parted the white whale from the victim. As she sullenly swam off, the boats flew to the rescue. Dragging into Stubb's boat with bloodshot, blinded eyes, the white brine caking in his wrinkles, the long tension of Ahab's bodily strength did crack, and helplessly he yielded to his body's doom. For a time, lying all crushed in the bottom of Stubb's boat, like one trodden upon foot of herds of elephants, far inland, nameless wails came from him, a desolate sound from out ravines. But this intensity of his physical prostate pro prostration did but so much the more abbreviate it. In an instant's compass, great hearts sometimes condensed to one deep pang. The sum total of those shallow pains kindly diffused through feebler men's whole lives. And so, such hearts, though summary in each one's suffering, still, if the gods decree it, in their lifetime, aggregate a whole age of woe, wholly made up of instantaneous intense intensities. For even in their pointless centers, these noble natures contain the entire circumference of inferior souls. The harpoon, said Ahab, halfway rising and dragging, leaning on one bended arm. Is it safe? Aye, sir, but it is not darted. This is it said Stubbs, showing it. Lay it before me. Any missing men? One, two, three, four, five. There were five oars, sir, and here are five men. That's good. Help me, man. I wish to stand. So, so I see him there, there, going to leeward still. What a leaping spout. Hands off me, the eternal sap. 
runs up in Ahab's bones again. Set the sail, out oars the helm. It is often the case that when a boat is stove, its crew, being picked up by another boat, help to work that second boat. And the chase is thus continued with what is called double banked oars. It was thus now. But the added power of the boat did not equal the added power of the whale, for he seemed to have treble banked his every fin, swimming with a velocity which plainly showed that if now, under these circumstances, pushed on, the chase would prove an indefinitely prolonged, if not a hopeless one, nor could any crew endure for so long a period. Such an untermitted, intense straining at the oar a thing barely tolerable only in some one brief vicissitude. The ship itself then, as it sometimes happened, offered the most promising intermediate means of overtaking the chase. Accordingly, the boats, the boat, the boats now made for her and were soon swayed up to their cranes, the two parts of the wrecked boat having been previously secured by her and then hoisting everything to her side and stacking her canvas high up, and sideways outstretching it with stunned sails, like the double-jointed wings of an albatross, the Pequod bore down in the leeward wake of Moby Dick. At the well-known methodic intervals, the whale's glittering spout was regularly announced from the manned mastheads, and when he would be reported as just gone down, Ahab would take the time, and then pacing the deck, binnacle watch in hand, and as soon as the last second of the allotted hour expired, expired, his voice was heard. Who's the balloon now? Do you see him? And if the reply was, no, sir, straight away, he commanded them to lift him to the perch. In this way, the day wore on. Ahab, now aloft and motionless anon, unrestingly pacing the planks. As he was thus walking, uttering no sound except to hail the men aloft, or to bid them hoist the sail a still higher, or to spread one to a still greater breath, thus to and fro pacing, beneath his slouched hat, at every turn he passed his own wrecked boat, which had been dropped upon the quarter-deck, and lay there reversed, broken bow to shattered stern. At last he paused before it, and as in an already overclouded sky, fresh troops of clouds will sometimes sail across, so over the old man's face there now stole some such added gloom as this. Stubb saw him pause, and perhaps intending not vainly, though, to evince his own unabated fortitude and thus keep up a valiant place in his captain's mind, he advanced and eyeing the wreck exclaimed, The thistle the ass refused. It pricked his mouth too keenly, sir. Ha ha! What soulless thing is this that laughs before a wreck? Man, man, did I not know thee brave as fearless fire, and as mechanical, I could swear thou wert a poltroon. Groan nor laugh should be heard before a wreck. Aye, sir, said Starbuck, nearing him, tis a solemn sight, an omen, and an ill one. Omen? Omen? The dictionary. If the gods think to speak outright to man, they will honorably speak outright not shake their heads and give an old wives' darkling hint. Be gone, you two are the opposite poles of one thing. Starbuck is stub reversed, and stub is Starbuck, and ye two are all mankind. And Ahab stands alone, alone among the millions of the peopled earth, nor gods nor men his neighbors. Cold, cold I shiver. How now? Aloft there, do you see him? Sing out for every sprout though he spout ten times a second. The day was nearly done. Only the hem of his golden robe was rustling. Soon it was almost dark, but the lookout men still remained unset. Can't see the spout now, sir, too dark, cried a voice from the air. How heading when last seen? As before, sir, straight to leeward. Good, he will travel slower now, tis night. Down royals and top gallant stun sails, Mr. Starbuck. We must not run over him before morning. He's making a passage now and may heave to a while. Helm there, keep her full before the wind. Aloft, come down. Mr. Stubb, 
Send a fresh hand to the foremast head and see it man till morning. Then advancing toward the doubloon in its main, main mass, Men, this gold is mine, for I earned it, but I shall let it abide here till the white whale is dead. And then, whosoever of ye first raises him, upon the day he shall be killed, this gold is that man's. And if on that day I shall again raise him, then ten times its sum shall be divided among all of ye. Away now, the deck is thine, sir. And so saying, he placed himself halfway within the scuttle, and slouching his hat, stood there till dawn, except when at intervals rousing himself to see how the night wore on. Chapter 134, The Chase, Second Day. At daybreak, the three mastheads were punctually manned afresh. You see him, cried Ahab, after allowing a little space for the light to spread. See nothing, sir. Turn up all hands and make sail. He travels faster than I thought for. The top gallant sails, aye, they should have been kept on her all night. But no matter, tis but resting for the rush. Here be it said that this pertinacious pursuit of one particular whale, continued through day and into night, and through night into day, is a thing by no means unprecedented in the South Sea fishery. For such is the wonderful skill, prescience of experience, and invincible confidence acquired by some great natural geniuses among the Nantucket commanders, that from the simple observation of a whale when last described, they will, under certain given circumstances, pretty accurately foretell both the direction in which he will continue to swim for a time while out of sight, as well as his probable rate of progression during that period. In these cases, somewhat as a pilot, when about losing sight of coast whose general trending he well knows, in which he desires shortly to return to again, but at some further point, like at, as his pilot stands by his compass and takes the precise bearing of the cape at present visible, in order the more certainly to hit out aright the remote unseen headland eventually to be visited. So does the fisherman at his compass with the whale, for after being chased and diligently marked through several hours of daylight, then when night obscures the fish, the creature's future wake through the darkness is almost as established to the sagacious mind of the hunter as the pilot's coast is to him. So that to this hunter's wondrous skill, the proverbial evanescence ev of a thing writ in water, a wake is to call desired purposes well nigh as reliable as the steadfast land. And as the mighty iron leviathan of the modern railway is so familiarly known in its every pace, that with watches in their hands, men time his rate at, as doctors that of a baby's pulse and lightly say of it, the up train or the down train will reach such or such a spot at such or such an hour. Even so, almost there are occasions when these Nantucketers time that other Leviathan of the deep according to the observed humor of his speed and say to themselves, so many hours hence, this whale will have gone 200 miles will have reached this or that degree of latitude or longitude. But to re render this acuteness at all successful in the end, the wind and the sea must be the whalemen's allies. For of what present avail to the becalmed or windbound mariner is the skill that assures him he is exactly 93 leagues and a quarter from his port? Inferable from these statements are many collateral subtle matters touching the chase of whales. The ship tore on, leaving such a furrow in the sea as when a cannonball, missent, becomes a plowshare and turns up the level field. By salt and hemp, cried Stump, by this swift motion of the deck creeps up one's legs and tingles at the heart. This ship and I are two brave fellows. Ha! Ha! Takes someone, take me up and launch me, spine-wise, on the sea, for by live oaks my spine's a keel. Ha! Ha, we go to the gate that leaves no dust behind. There she blows, she blows, she blows, right ahead, was now the masthead cry. Aye, aye, cried Stubb, I knew it, ye can't escape. Blow on and split your spout, O whale. The mad fiend himself is after ye. Blow your trump, blister your lungs. 
Ahab will dam off your blood as a miller shuts his water gate upon the stream. And Stubb did but speak for all well nigh all that crew. The frenzies of the chase by this time worked them bubblingly up like old wine worked anew. Whatever pale fears and foreboding some of them might have felt before, these were not only now kept out of sight through the growing awe of Ahab, but they were broken up and all sides routed as timid prairie hares that scatter before the bounding bison. The hand of fate had snatched all their souls, and by the stirring perils of the previous day, the rack of the past night's suspense, the fixed, unfearing, blind, reckless way in which their wild craft went plunging toward its flying mark. By all these things, their hearts were bowled along. The wind that made great bellies of their sails and rushed the vessel on by arms invisible as irresistible. This seemed the symbol of that, that unseen agency which so enslaved them to the race. They were one man, not 30. For as the one ship that held them all, though it was put together of all contrasting things, oak and maple and pine wood, iron and pitch and hemp, yet all these ran into each other in one concrete hull, which shot on its way, both balanced and directed by the long central keel. Even so, all the individualities of the crew, this man's valor, that man's fear, guilt and guiltiness, all varieties were welded into oneness and were all directed to that fatal goal which Ahab, their one lord and keel, did point to. The rigging lived. The mastheads, like the tops of tall palms, were outspreadingly tufted with arms and legs. Clinging to a spar with one hand, some reached forth the other with impatient wavings. Others, shading their eyes from the vivid sunlight, sat far out on the rocking yards. All the spars in full bearing of mortals, ready and ripe for their fate. Ah, how they still strove through the infinite blueness to seek out the thing that might destroy them. Why sing ye not out for him if ye see him, cried Ahab, when the lapse of some minutes since the first cry no more had been heard. Sway me up, men, ye've been deceived. Not Moby Dick cast one odd jet that way and disappears. It was even so. In their headlong eagerness, the men had mistaken some other thing for the whale spout, as the event itself soon proved. For hardly had Ahab reached his perch, hardly was the rope belayed to its pin on deck, when he struck the keynote to an orchestra that made the air vibrate as with a combined discharge of rifles. The triumphant halloo of thirty buckskin lungs was heard as, much nearer to the ship than the place of the imaginary jet, less than a mile ahead, Moby Dick bodily burst into view. For not by any calm and indolent spoutings, not by the peaceful gush of that mystic fountain in its head, did the white whale now reveal his vicinity, but by the far more wondrous phenomenon of breaching. Rising with his utmost velocity from the furthest depths, the sperm whale thus booms his entire bulk into the pure element of air, and pilling up a mountain of dazzling foam shows his place to the distance of seven miles and more. In those moments, the torn, enraged waves he shakes off seem his mane. In some cases, this breaching is his act of defiance. There she breaches, there she breaches, was the cry, as in his immeasurable bravados, the white whale tossed himself salmon-like to heaven. So suddenly seen in the blue plain of the sea and relieved against the still bluer margin of the sky, the spray that he raised, for the moment, intolerably glittered and glared like a glacier, and stood there gradually fading and fading away from its first sparkling intensity to the dim mistiness of an advancing shower in a veil. I breach your last to the sun, Moby Dick, cried Ahab. Thy honor and thy harpoon are at hand. Down, down all of ye, but one man at the fore. The boats, stand by! Unmindful of the tedious rope ladders of the shrouds, the men, like shooting stars, slid to the deck by the isolated backstays and halyards, while Ahab, less dartingly, but still rapidly, was dropped from his perch. Lower away, he cried so soon as he had reached his boat, a spare one, rigged the afternoon previous. 
Mr. Starbuck, the ship is thine. Keep away from the boats, but keep near them. Lower all, as if to strike a quick terror into them. By this time, being the first assailant himself, Moby Dick had turned and was now coming for the three, three crews. Ahab's boat was central. And cheering his men, he told them, he would take to the whale head, head and head, that is, pull straight up to his forehead. A not uncommon thing, for when within a certain limit, such a course excludes the coming onset from the whale's sidelong vision. But ere that close limit was gained, and while yet all three boats were plain as the ship's three masts to his eye, the white whale, churning himself into furious speed, almost in an instant, as it were, rushing among the boats with open jaws and a lashing tail, offered appalling battle on every side, and heedless of the irons darted at him from every boat, seemed only intent on annihilating each separate plank of those which the boats were made. But skillfully maneuvered, incessantly wheeling like trained chargers in the field, the boats for a while eluded him, though at times by a plank's breadth, while all the time Ahab's unearthly slogan tore every other cry but his to shreds. But at last, in its untraceable evolutions, the white whale so crossed and recrossed that in a thousand ways entangled the slack of the three lines now fast to him, that they foreshortened and of themselves warped the devoted boats towards the planted irons in him. Though now for a moment the whale drew aside a little, as if to rally for a more tremendous charge. Seizing that opportunity, Ahab first paid out more line and then was rapidly hauling and jerking in upon it again, hoping that way to disencumber it of some snarls, when lo, a sight more savage than the embattled teeth of sharks. Caught and twisted, backscrewed in the maze of the lines, loose harpoons and lances with all their bristling barbs and points came flashing and dripping up the shocks in the bow of Ahab's boat. Only one thing could be done. Seizing the boat knife, he critically re reached within, through and then without, this rays of steel, dragged in the line beyond and passed it inboard to the bowsman, and then, twice sundering the rope near the shocks, dropped the intercepted faggot of steel into the sea and was all fast again. That instant, the white whale made a sudden rush among the remaining tangles of the other lines, by so doing irresistibly dragged the more involved boats of stub and flask towards his flukes, dashing them together like two rolling husks on a surf-beaten beach, and then, diving down into the sea, disappeared in a boiling maelstrom, in which, for a space, the odorous Caesar chips of the wrecks danced round and round like a grated nutmeg in a swiftly stirred bowl of punch. While the two crews were yet circling in the waters, reaching out after the revolving line tubs, oars, and other floating furniture, while a slow little fat flask bobbed up and down like an empty vial, twitching his legs upwards to escape the dreaded jaws of sharks, and Stubb was lustily singing out for someone to ladle him up. And while the old man's line, now parting, admitted of his pulling into the creamy pool to rescue him whom he could, in that wild simultaneousness of a thousand concreted perils, Ahab's yet unstricken boat seemed drawn up towards heaven by invisible wires. As arrow light shooting perpendicularly from the sea, the white whale dashed his broad forehead against its bottom and sent it turning over and over into the air till it fell again, gunnel downwards, and Ahab and his men struggled out from under it like seals from a seaside cave. The first uprising momentum of the whale, modifying its direction as he struck the surface, involuntarily launched him along it to a little distance from the center of the destruction he had made. And with his back to it, he now lay for a moment, slowly feeling for his flukes from side to side. And whenever a stray oar, bit of plank, a least chip or crumb of the boats touched his skin, his tail swiftly drew back and caved sideways, smiting the sea. But soon, as if satisfied with his work that for that time was done, he pushed his pleated forehead through the ocean and trailing after him the intertangled lines continued his lured way at a traveler's methodic pace.
As before, the attentive ship, having described the whole fight, again came bearing down to the rescue, and dropping a boat, picked up the floating mariners, tubs, oars, and whatever else could be caught at, and safely landed them on her decks. Some sprained shoulders, wrists and ankles, livid contusions, wrench, wrenched harpoons and lances, inextricable intricacies of rope, shattered oars and planks, all these were there, but no fatal or even serious ill seemed to have befallen anyone. As with Fidala the day before, so Ahab was now found grimly clinging to his boat's broken half, which afforded a comparatively easy float, nor did it so exhaust him as the previous day's mishap. But when he was helped to the deck, all eyes were fastened upon him, as instead of standing by himself, he still half hung upon the shoulder of Starbuck, who th had thus far been the foremost to assist him. His ivory leg had been snapped off, leaving but one short, sharp splinter. Ay, ay, Starbuck, tis sweet to lean sometimes. Be the leaner who he will, and would old Ahab had leaned oftener than he has. The ferrule has not stood up, sir, said the carpenter, now coming up. I could put good work into that leg, but no groans spoken, sir, I hope, said Starbuck with true concern. I and all splintered to pieces, Stubb, you see it, that even with a broken bone, old Ahab is untouched, and I account no living bone of mine, one jot more me than this dead one that's lost. Nor white whale, nor man, nor fiend can so much as graze old Ahab in his proper and inaccessible being. Can any lead touch yonder floor? Any mast scrape yonder roof? Aloft there, which way? Dead to leeward, sir. Up helm then. Pile on the sail again, shipkeepers. Down the rest of the spare boats and rig them. Mr. Starbuck, away and muster the boat's crews. Let me first help thee towards the bulwark, sir. Oh, 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 how this splinter gores me now, accursed faith that the unconquerable captain in the soul should have such a craven mate. Sir, my body man, not thee. Give me something for a cane. There, that shivered lance will do. Must of the men. Surely I've not seen him yet. By heaven it cannot be. Missing. Quick, call them all. The old man's hinted thought was true. Upon mustering the company, the Parsi was not there. The Parsi, cried Stubb. He must have been caught in... The black vomit wrench thee, run all of ye above a low cabin, forecastle, find him. Not gone, not gone. But quickly they returned to him with the tidings that the Parsi was nowhere to be found. Aye, sir, said Stubb, caught among the tangles of your line. I thought I saw him dragging under. My line? My line? Gone? Gone? What means that little word? What death knell rings in it? Do you see it? That old Ahab shakes as if he were the belfry, the harpoon too, toss over the litter there. Do you see it? The forged iron men, the white whales. No, 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 blistered fool, this hand did dart it, tis in the fish. Aloft there, keep him nailed, quick, all hands to the rigging of the boats. Collect the oars, harpooners, the irons, the irons, hoist the royals higher. A pull on all the sheets, helm there, steady. Steady for your life, I'll ten times girdle the unmeasured globe, yea, and dive straight through it, but I'll slay him yet. Great God, but for one single instant show thyself, cried Starbuck. Never, never wilt thou capture him, old man. In Jesus' name, no more of this. That's worse than devil's madness. Two days chased, twice stove to splinters, thy very leg once more snatched from under thee, thy evil shadow gone all good angels mobbing thee with warnings. What more wouldst thou have? Shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? Oh, oh, impiety and blasphemy to hunt him more. Starbuck, of late I felt strangely moved to thee ever since that hour we both saw Thou knowest what in one another's eyes. But in this matter of the whale, be the front of thy face to me as the palm of this hand, a lipless, unfeatured blank. 
Ahab is forever Ahab, man. This whole act's immutably decreed. Twas rehearsed by thee and me a billion years before this ocean rolled. Fool, I am the fate's lieutenant. I act under orders. Look thou, underling, that thou obeyest mine. Stand round me, men. Ye see an old man cut down to the stump, leaning on a shivered lance, propped up on a lonely foot. Tis Ahab, his body's part, but Ahab's soul's a centipede that moves upon a hundred legs. I feel strained, half stranded, as ropes that tow dismasted frigates in the gale, and I may look so. But ere I break, ye'll hear me crack. Until ye hear that, know that Ahab's hauser tows his purpose yet. Believe ye, men, in the things called omens, then laugh aloud and cry on core, for ere they drown, drowning things will twice rise to the surface, then rise again to sink forevermore. So with Moby Dick. Two days he's floated. Tomorrow will be the third. Aye, men, he'll rise once more, but only to spout his last. Do you feel brave, men? Brave. As fearless fire, cried Stubb. And as mechanical, muttered Ahab. Then as the men went forward, he muttered on. The things called omens. And yesterday I talked the same to Starbuck there, concerning my broken boat. Oh, how valiantly I seek to drive out of others' hearts what's clinched so fast in mine. The Parsi, the Parsi, gone, gone. And he was to go before. But still was to be seen again ere I could perish? How's that? There's a riddle now might baffle all the lawyers backed by the ghosts of the whole line of judges. Like a hawk's beak, it'll preck, it pecks my brain. I'll, I'll solve it, though. When dusk descended, the whale was still in sight to leeward. So once more the sail was shortened and everything passed nearly as on the previous night. Only the sound of hammers and the hum of the grindstone was heard until nearly daylight as the men toiled by lanterns in the complete and careful rigging of the spare boats and sharpening their fresh weapons for the morrow. Meantime, of the broken keel of Ahab's wrecked craft, the carpenter made him another leg, while still as on the night before, slouched Ahab stood fixed within his scuttle, his hid heliotrope glance anticipatingly gone backward on its dial, sat due eastward to the earliest sun.